Uh, please give a warm SpooCon 2020 uh, introduction to Mark. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. And I, ju I just want to say up front, uh, you, you might notice that my voice is a little messed up. I've been battling the flu uh, all weekend, but uh, we're going to get through this with some energy drinks and cough, cough drops here. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I know uh, Sunday morning on a con is, is kind of a tough one, but uh, I appreciate you guys being here. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, about knowing the unfuzz and finding bugs with coverage analysis. So uh, about me, like probably a lot of you, I was always really interested by puzzles as a kid growing up, and then computers and software kind of became like how puzzles played into what I like to do every day. So I got into programming. I uh, eventually got into computer security, and I've been entertained by bugs ever since because it's like a bug is kind of the imperfection of the person behind the code manifesting. Um, already waxing poetic. Uh, but yeah, there's just this really cool connection between how we interact with software and sort of the seams between and how we use tools. And I've always been interested in that, and I've been interested in how do we do the things that we do better and faster. Uh, so I've been enjoying fuzzing for a long time. My first fuzz experience was in 2011 when I read uh, like the, the first book on fuzzing and put together something to fuzz Adobe Reader and crashed it within a day. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting experience. Nowadays, I'm working at For All Secure. So a lot of this research was done uh, with the support of For All Secure. A lot of my uh, great colleagues supported me and bounced ideas off uh, throughout this work. So I'm really thankful to work with those great people. Uh, doing fuzzing and symbolic execution research. So that's what we're going to get into. Uh, today, this is, this is what I'm going to talk about. Hopefully, if you uh, see these words and it seems like what you're here uh, to hear about, then stay. Otherwise, hang out. Uh, so we're going to talk about fuzzing, code coverage, talking about scripting over a, sort of a new idea of an abstraction for code coverage, and then using Binary Ninja to do some interesting things, and then applying that to uh, some experimentation I did, finding bugs. So why are, we, why are we having this talk? Well, motivation's pretty clear. We want to find bugs. And really, if it comes right down to it, you're usually going to do one of two things. Code auditing is cool, but uh, I'm a little biased here. I think that fuzzing is, is kind of an interesting thing because you set it up, you let it rip, and bugs just fall out. It's like magic. So join me on my little journey here as we talk about fuzzing better. obligatory memes, and uh, let me just say, if you haven't heard of fuzzing uh, and it's totally new to you, don't worry. I think that you'll be able to come along with us on this journey, and uh, I'll talk through some pictures in here just in a minute, uh, not, because, uh, not because it's easier, but I think that pictures are sometimes more memorable. But just to start, if you haven't heard of fuzzing, it works really well. Uh, sort of my law of fuzzing is that uh, if it's never been fuzzed, you'll probably find bugs. That seems like a pretty bold statement. Uh, I'm pretty confident in it. Now, the you'll probably found, find bugs sounds kind of like a hedge, but uh, I think it's really just because it, it's simple enough without getting into all the factors. I would say if you're talking C, C++ code, the likelihood goes way up. If you're talking about Rust, for example, likelihood goes down, but there have been a lot of interesting bugs found in Java, Go, Rust with fuzzing, so it's not that uh, new languages have killed fuzzing's potential. It's just that there are certain kinds of bugs that fuzzing is really good at finding, and the more of those kinds of bugs that you're looking for or you're able to find in the target, uh, the better chances are of finding bugs. And also, of course, the fuzz is the <laughs> if you fuzz it well. If you just try something once and uh, you're, you're fuzzing something like a JavaScript interpreter, uh, you kind of have to know what you're doing a little bit, but we'll get into some of the techniques. Uh, if, you, if you haven't heard of AFL, and then you probably haven't heard of fuzzing, because I feel like everybody's heard of both. But I don't think that people really appreciate what the big steps forward that AFL took were. Now, AFL has a lot of really great things that it did, but there was one thing, in my opinion, that really made fuzzing go from an interesting thing to do to something that like really, really works and everybody should do it. And it's this idea of coverage-guided fuzzing. 
And I'm gonna talk through some pictures here in a minute, but that coverage-guided generational fuzzing is sort of the step from what we call dumb fuzzing to coverage-guided fuzzing, I think was the, the biggest thing. And that's gonna play, of course, into this talk a little bit. But, uh, so let's, let's go through some pictures. So if we're gonna fuzz something, we start with the target program. We don't necessarily know what it is, and that's kind of the key, is that fuzzers don't know what the program is. It could be anything. Uh, we just know that it takes input, arbitrary input. You have to set up your target so that it does take some input. So if it's something weird, then you have to deal with that sort of thing. But the idea is we can send arbitrary input to the program. And this program may or may not work on that input, but we just want to make sure that it doesn't do something bad. Because if you send like a very specific custom input, or maybe it's just something that the programmer didn't expect, if something bad happens, well, you want to know about it if you're uh, a security researcher or just the developer of the program. So what does fuzzing do in this? So with a fuzzer, depicted as the robot, of course, it's just generating a lot of randomized inputs, sending them to the program, and then watching to see if the program crashes or not. This is what we'd call dumb fuzzing, because it's just generating random inputs, and it may have some sense of what to generate, but generally it's just seeing if the target crashed or not. This was sort of the pre-AFL days. With AFL, or excuse me, so what, what we have for a fuzz cycle is we'd start with some inputs, we'd mutate those inputs, just many, 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 and watch to see if the program ever crashes, and then we'd have crashing inputs at the end of it. With AFL, we had this coverage guidance thing represented by this uh, neat little camera here. Now, it's not a perfect understanding of what the target program does, but it gives a sense of when the program actually did something different or new. And so, as a result, we're not just looking for crashes at the end, we're looking for crashing or new behaviors. And so now the output isn't just crashes, it's also more inputs that cause the program to do new and interesting things. This is a significant step. One, not just because, you know, you, you get something more than just uh, crashes, but it's also very effective. This idea that when you can see an input cause new behavior and then recycle that input back into the fuzz cycle to then be mutated more, this is a really key step. So, this coverage instrumentation was the key step that, uh, as far as I know, AFL introduced that showed when new code is reached. And as a result, this output corpus represents something new because it has a sense of it was generated by watching when new behavior uh, was exercised. And so you could also just use this, this sort of coverage guidance to minimize the corpus. So you can start with a lot of files, run them all through the target, watch to see which ones do which behaviors, and then have a minimal set. And that's, uh, and so which ones have equivalent functionality? Well, we'll just keep one of those. Um, this is also uh, a powerful technique, and we'll see why in a minute how we can use this in interesting ways or what it means, but for the purposes of this talk, this is just setting the stage. The fuzzer doesn't really matter. I don't care what fuzzer you use. This is more, we're gonna talk coverage, which is more of a meta thing than just the fuzzer. There's been a lot of good work on making fuzzers better. That's not what this is. When, usually when I ask people about code coverage, this is their reaction. Like, yeah, I've heard of code coverage. Uh, but if you haven't, let me just give you the, the real quick intro. There's three primary types of code coverage that people t tend to talk about. Statement block and line coverage are logically equivalent. Um, edge coverage and path coverage those are the three big types. There's more than that. But in general, the thing to remember is that the more uh, descriptive the coverage type is, the more expensive it is to collect and the more information you have to store. And so when people talk about coverage, regardless of which three, typically they're going to use it either to say what got executed or they're going to use it as a measure of how much of the possible um, space got executed. And so let me, let me walk through this with a graphical example. So we've got this part of a function. This represents basic blocks, which just there's a single entry. We've got conditional jumps. So if we were to look at block edge and path coverage, you've got block coverage, which just shows you which blocks executed without any idea of ordering. Edge coverage obviously shows you go which transitions you took. Path coverage is like block coverage, but it shows you the order. And so it, it is a lot more descriptive, so it takes up more space. So at the bottom is kind of the interesting thing. How many times do you have to go through this, this snippet in order to get 100% coverage for that kind of coverage? Well, with block and edge, you can do it with two because you could sort of go on the left side once and then you can go on the right side once. 
With path coverage, you have four separate paths. You could go left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. But this is a very simple thing. What's more, uh, what's more realistic in programs is actually something that has a loop. So if we had a, an edge back to the top at the end, now with block and edge coverage, you can actually cover the whole snippet. You can cover all the blocks, all the edges in one go through. You just have to take the loop back up and sort of go the other way. But with path coverage, there's actually now an infinite number of paths through this program as long as you don't know ahead of time if that loop could terminate. And so the big takeaway here is that block coverage is the simplest, edge coverage is more detailed, and path coverage is insane. So generally speaking, we use block coverage as a rough estimate. Edge coverage is a pretty granular estimate, and that's what AFL uh, and other coverage-guided fuzzers typically use. And very few people use path coverage because it's a trade-off. And if you've done unit testing, you're probably familiar with line coverage um, because it looks like this. This is uh, LCOV being shown. This tool, LCOV, is about 20 years old. Uh, it works really well because you can see, hey, this, these are the, the lines of catech. Oh my gosh, you can't see that. Well, you would be able to see that if the blue showed up better. But uh, so the idea is, if a line gets executed, we highlight it in one color. If it doesn't get executed, we highlight it in another. So this tool's been around for a really long time. It's used traditionally in unit testing, but it can also be used in fuzzing. Uh, this is a newer version of the same thing. Uh, these are modern tools that people are writing about like this year and last year. And so not much has changed, as you can see. It's just highlighting lines. So how do we bring this into fuzzing? Well, typically, you've got the fuzz cycle, which I already showed. And then you'd either rebuild the target with coverage instrumentation or use dynamic binary instrumentation. And what that allows you to do is take those inputs that were generated, it's those uh, blue boxes, the output corpus that we talked about, you run that through the target, and then you get the coverage information out. And so we're gonna talk about block coverage um, because, like I said, block and line coverage are logically equivalent. It's basically which blocks got executed, which lines got executed. It's just yes or no, no order. So you can do the same thing for fuzzing, and you can go back and you can look at what lines got executed, what didn't get executed by your fuzzer. This is what a lot of people are saying is like a, a really good thing. Pretty much everybody agrees who does fuzzing that you should be doing this. But it just seems like it's pretty basic. The end, at the end of the day, it just makes it so you can peruse code with pretty highlights, which is nice. Um, it's really good if you're working in a software development shop and you want to see, hey, somebody made a change to the code, what lines are covered in the tests, et cetera. But if you're trying to find bugs, manual review may not be what you want. If you're trying to look at somebody else's code and it's a really big code base, what, is, what does line highlighting do, do for you? It really just tells you where their tests don't cover. Or if you're fuzzing, what parts of the code uh, you're not yet fuzzing. And a lot of these tools assume you have source. And I'm just gonna put it out there. If you're one of those people who doesn't always have source, who lives in your debugger, and your disassembler, you're my people. I appreciate you. So this tool's for you. Um, and when we think about it, at the end of the day, if, if we go back to that output corpus that was generated with the idea that every single one of these inputs exercises new functionality, there's actually a lot of meaning in that corpus. We just have to sift it out. Because if you think about it, the coverage information, so if we take that minimized corpus where each input does something different with the program, the coverage information shows which parts of the program that input executed. The coverage information is then the link between the input and the functionality of the target. And that's actually a really powerful thing. It may not seem like it yet, but we'll, we'll talk more about it. And as I researched and tried to figure out who else is doing this, I didn't find really anybody talking about this idea except for one tool, CovNavi from uh, Talos. Uh, they used source and they used Jorn to, to reason about source. So it was a pretty interesting thing, but we don't always have source and I wanted to make something that, that would work for people who are uh, looking at binaries. But the basic idea here is that once we have this correlation from an input to functionality, then we can start to put together this static and dynamic information because the the real missing link between static and dynamic is what code gets executed when you run a particular input or when you run the program in a, in a specific way. So I'm focusing on block coverage because like I said, 
Coverage is all about a trade-off. You have to figure out what information you need and then don't take any more because you're just gonna spend a lot of time processing it otherwise. Um, so what tools do we use for this? Well, uh, if you read the abstract or thought about it, it probably was clear. Or maybe the shirt gave away, I don't know. Uh, Binary Ninja is a pretty awesome tool. So it's a reverse engineering framework, but the real reason I picked Binary Ninja is it's API. Also, at the time when I was first writing this tool, Gitter wasn't public, so. Uh, I'm a big fan of Binary Ninja. Their API allows you to do a lot of awesome stuff, but really the only things that we're we're focusing on in this talk at the, the basic level is finding functions, breaking them into control flow graphs, and then being able to do call target analysis. I'll get into that later, what we do with that. But all of this context about the program and the static analysis stuff is available through these APIs, so it's super powerful. So uh, we're gonna propose a new workflow which basically just adds another step to the one we just saw, which is we fuzz, we take the inputs, we get the coverage data, I use Dynamo Rio, but you could really use anything for this. You could just single step your target through a debugger and then just record the instruction pointer at every step and get coverage information. I use Dynamo Rio, there's a script in the, in the BN code repo for, uh, for automating this for basic fuzz cases, but you can do it any way you like. And then the, the final step is we're gonna take that generated coverage data where we've got one coverage file for each of the inputs and then we're gonna import it into Binary Ninja scripting environment which is gonna allow us to do a lot of cool things. So when I say import it into the scripting environment, what am I talking about? Well, nobody has really, that, that I've found, talked about what coverage data structure should look like. In fact, if you look for what the coverage file formats look like, for like GCOV or SANCOV or Clang, or excuse me, LLVMCOV, they're actually pretty opaque. Nobody really writes about them. Uh, so I, I kinda thought about this and I wanted to come from the angle of, I wanna write a tool that's super easy to understand and I wanna do as little as possible. Just have very transparent uh, abstraction so that anybody could rewrite it or customize it any way they'd like and it would still work. So in order to do this, I wrote a Python plugin for Binary Ninja, which is actually very easy. This was actually, uh, this whole project started off as sort of my first uh, Binary Ninja plugin. So it just goes to show with with a little bit of code, the Binary Ninja environment is very powerful. So the first thought with what do you do with coverage is you just show which basic blocks got executed. This idea wasn't new. Lighthouse did this for IDA. It wasn't available for Binary Ninja at the time. But actually doing basic block highlighting with Binja is really easy. But yeah, Marcus uh, did a great job with Lighthouse. It's a slightly different use case and so uh, when I did do this for Binary Ninja and I was just looking at highlighting, I was approaching it from the what do I want for fuzzing and for automation. But we start with the basic block highlighting. So on the right we have this uh, function graph and this is the classic coverage guided fuzzer uh, target where it tests one character at a time to see if you've typed in a magic input and then if you get all the way through all of the nested if conditions, it crashes. So as you can see, the heat map is, is the default basic block highlighting scheme. And this is nice for fuzzing because it gives you a sense right away what the common code is and what the uncommon code is. So you can see the red block at the bottom. This is a minimized corpus. And so we've discarded all of the duplicate seeds. So that bright red block at the bottom is the, is the crash. You only need one input that gets all the way down there. But at the top, all of the inputs go through the prologue of the function. So this just gives you a really nice visual way to see what's common functionality in the code and as you branch out uh, through different functions you'll be able to see like hey do a lot of inputs go through this function or is it just one and it only goes this way. So this is, uh, this is kind of a nice thing but it's still just manual. What I found myself asking was what, what do I want from coverage information and when I started looking at the questions that I was asking, I started seeing that I was asking almost the same thing every time. And so really it came to me that I should be automating this. In order to automate it, highlighting isn't what you should be making an abstraction for. You should be making it for what makes sense for coverage. So if we think about what a trace file is, that's, a, that's what I call 
the coverage information for a specific input. You get your input and then you've got your trace file. And the trace file is just a list of, of blocks where blocks are represented as an offset uh, into the, the module, into the executable or DLL or shared object, and then a length. And this is recorded by a tool like Dynamo Rio. So if we want to think about how do we take this idea and map it into a data structure, I came up with uh, a, a class to sort of keep everything together, but it's really only two things, and it's just two dictionaries that m sort of map to the reverse of each other. You have a mapping of trace names to offsets. So this is just the simple idea of, hey, the trace name indicates the input that it came from, and so this is mapping the input to the blocks it covers. And then the reverse, which is if I want to look at uh, a block, which is just an offset into the module, that basic block, I want to know what traces cover it. And then from there, we build everything else on top of these two things. But that's, that's really all. We take this, uh, this Dynamo Rio or DRCOV style file and map it into that. And I just want to say, like, for anybody who's wondering, like, hey, what's the deal with Dynamo Rio? It's just a cross-platform tool that's freely available, so I went with that. If you wanted to bring in your coverage data in some other format, totally works. There's a few other out there, but the DRCOV format was used by Lighthouse and a few others, so it's a common one. And then beyond this simple, like, two dictionary ab abstraction, everything else is just brought in by Binary Ninja and its ability to script over the basic ideas of the target. So there's really not a whole lot of magic in BNCOV other than this coverage DB, and it's got just a, a couple of member data structures and then a bunch of helper functions that I just wrote because I found myself doing these things over and over again. So when we look at what we have, like how do you use this thing? The way that it started was an improved interactive experience. So if you've never used Binary Ninja before, it's got this built-in Python co console that's really handy because you can just navigate to wherever you are, you can start scripting different things and figuring out the answers to your questions. So what I've, what I've shown right here is you can see that compare instruction is highlighted and then below, if you can read that, uh, I'm asking via the coverage database, uh, the dot get traces from block function shows me, hey, what traces cover this block? And then I'm passing this meta variable here, which indicates the address that the cursor is currently at. So it's really cool to me to just be able to click on an address and then start scripting and like, yeah, show me information about here. And then as you can see, I printed out the two test cases that covered that uh, basic block. So this is a really cool thing to be able to have an improved like scripting interactive environment. It's super powerful if you've never played with it. And if you've got, if you had an old version of Binary Ninja that didn't have tab complete in the Python console, I would definitely give it another shot now because tab complete is super helpful. But then the bigger thing is, for me anyways, is that you can run this headlessly uh, as long as you have the right license for Binary Ninja. You can run all this stuff headlessly. So we could do the fuzzing, we can do the, the coverage mapping, get the coverage data, and then with this scripting abstraction, we can just run all this analysis headlessly and start to answer questions. So if you came here looking for an easy button, I'm sorry to say, this is not it, but if you were looking for cool ways to write new scripts and do awesome stuff, then you're in the right place. And honestly, like there's no running away from the requirement to be able to think about what you're doing. So if, if, we, if we look at what we can do, we can start answering questions. What traces cover this block? Well, I showed that in the last slide. Uh, I use CovDB as just the shorthand for the current instance of a coverage database. The simplest questions, what traces cover this block? What functions have zero coverage? Well, uh, this is one of those helpers that I just have a collect function coverage helper, and then you just ask for which ones have zero coverage. And then if you want to invert that, that's also really helpful. So the cool thing about this is the more that I talk to people about what they would do with this, the more cool ideas I get. So somebody was asking me just recently if they could just use this as an automated way to run a program once and then see what functions got executed. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's crazy easy. But imagine how awesome that would be if you just had this big opaque blob that you could pop into Binary Ninja with the coverage data of having run it once and then just like auto annotate function names or put comments and stuff like that over what 
what functions got executed and which ones didn't. We're starting to see some of the potential here. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the interesting concepts that I find myself thinking about a lot, and it turns out as I've talked to people, other people think about this, is this idea of a coverage frontier. When you have a basic block um, and you take one of the outgoing edges but not the other, it's sort of the question of, well, why didn't I take that other one? What kept me from going down that road? And that is a very common question as we start to look across a, a target. And so I just wrote a helper function because this is a very simple idea, uh, which I've laid out here in the middle. Just for each of the addresses in the, in the overall coverage set, just look up the basic block, look up what outgoing edges it has, are each of those basic blocks covered? If all of them are covered, well, I don't really need to worry about that block. But if they're not, then it, it's part of the, the coverage frontier, if you will, and it becomes interesting. And I'll show an example on the next slide. What did coverage over time look like? This is, this is kind of an in interesting one, and this is one of those things where I think that visualization could be really cool. So like, one of the ideas that I had, and something you can do very easily with BNCOV, is it has the ability to watch a directory for new inputs coming in and then automatically ingest the new coverage files and then update the, the Binary Ninja UI so you can see the fuzzer working and see new blocks getting colored as the fuzzer explores the target. And then you could also do something clever like, uh, I have a helper function there where it basically zips the UI to whatever address you want and so you can just watch for new blocks coming in and then just zip the UI around to, to wherever um, the new coverage came in, and I bet you could create like a nifty GIF out of that or something. Uh, so let's let's talk about the traditional VR question. So this is probably what a lot of you are interested in: is how do we do some of the coveted, scripted vulnerability research stuff with Binary Ninja with this coverage stuff? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, the more complex stuff that you want to do, the harder it gets. But a common one: if if your target has calls to to stir copy, you might want to know, hey, which ones are hit? So this is a, a little snippet that would show you that. It's just uh, creating a set that's going to collect the calls, find the address of string copy, find everywhere that that string copy address is referenced, find the, the basic blocks where those references are. So this is, this is the call to stir, or stir copy. And then is that basic block in the coverage set? And that's it. And so you can go from, okay, this target has stir copy in it to, hey, we covered all the calls to stir copy, just like that. And then you could start to do even more clever things like do data flow analysis or other interesting things, um, such as running things in a, in a debugger. So let's do something. So now let's start to put these queries together with other tools, start to bring in other information that doesn't even reside in Binary Ninja and start to get even more clever, start to show even more potential. So if the question was, can you show me the source code, just the lines, where we had that idea of a frontier, where there was a conditional, where we only went down one side of the conditional but not the other, but that conditional guarded a function call, which uh, generally is, is kind of an interesting thing. We miss the opportunity to call another function. Well, show me the source code for that. Well, the idea of involving source code would require us to bring in some other information. And the way that you would do that, so we could get to the frontier, we can get to the basic blocks. But from there, to make the jump to source code, we need two things. One is you need the address to line mapping, and that's in, a, in the debug symbols that are put in the binary if you compile with dash g dash G uh, line table only for, for Clang. So that allows you to do the address to line mapping. And then that gives you, hey, this offset in your binary corresponds to this file in line. And then if you have the access to the source, then you can just print out the, the source lines involved. So find uncovered calls. It's in the repo. Check it out. Uh, if you want to do something else, another sort of interesting automation thing, if I'm at a particular address that I know is covered, but I want to get like a specific piece of information, like what's the value of EAX or something, well, the coverage information tells you what inputs cover that, and then you could just spin up a, a debugger, run to that point, and then dump out your, your desired information, 
right? And that saves you from having to run through potentially tens of thousands of inputs and just gets you to the ones that actually cover that block. So binary ninjas integrated debugger uh, coming out soon. Uh, get ready for that. I think that once once that's available, people will really start to appreciate the idea of having a scriptable debugger, scriptable uh, static analysis, and then coverage information, giving you the ability to script and reason over this dynamic analysis information. All right. Deep breath. That was a lot. Uh, just trying to show that there's a lot of possibilities here. BN Cub doesn't give you the answers. It gives you the ability to ask questions and then answer those. Um, Really, if there's anything that's the magic here, it's the binary ninja scripting environment, and then I just introduced like a really simple coverage abstraction that allows you to link inputs to all of that other information. So let's talk about uh, what I originally said we were gonna do. We're gonna know what is unfuzzed, we're gonna find bugs with what we know. And the only things you need are a fuzzer, doesn't matter which one, uh, coverage guided fuzzer uh, is recommended, binary ninja, bncov, and those sweet, sweet custom scripts that you're now writing. So knowing what, what is un unfuzzed, very simple. If you wanted to see line coverage, you can actually pull line coverage out of, uh, out of a debug build. We kind of saw that with the adder to line example. Dynamo Rio com comes with a drcov to lcov script that allows you to see that awesome 2000 era HTML report if you want that. Um, but really, with BNCov, knowing what is unfuzz is pretty obvious. You fuzz, you look at what's covered, and there you go. Uh, it seems pretty simple, but someone once asked me, how do you know if someone else has fuzzed that thing, though? Right? So like, you can fuzz it, but how do you know if someone else hasn't fuzzed it? And I was like, well, that's easy. If you find bugs, then, someone else, then nobody else has fuzzed it. Or at least they haven't disclosed those bugs. And they're like, yeah, but how do you know they didn't disclose those bugs? I was like, well, you figure that one out. You let me know. Uh, yeah, but one of, the, one of the cool things that you can do is you can actually take coverage and import it across harnesses. Uh, so when I say harness, I'm talking about you've got a code base like a library or a binary, and you're going to call a specific function and feed input to it. That's what, that's what we call harnessing. So if you had a library that had a parse XML and a parse JSON function, you might write a harness for the XML one and the JSON one. And then that would give you two entry points to the library. And you can actually combine the coverage across those two harnesses. As long as you are building uh, against the same library, so it's like the same compile, uh, or if you are linking against the, the same static object, then you can import from multiple harnesses and start to build that combined coverage picture from across multiple harnesses. And that's actually a really cool thing, um, very similar to the way that if you had a unit test suite, you'd probably want to look at the coverage from across the unit test. Well, this allows us to do the same thing, but for fuzzing and look across harnesses. Because really, in my opinion, the end goal for fuzzing should be kind of like unit testing. Yeah, with unit test, you can write one and then just stop, but that seems kind of silly. But a lot of people do that with fuzzing. They'll fuzz one thing and then just stop. And I think it's because they don't have as much information about reasoning uh, what they should be doing. So this is the typical fuzz approach uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. People will pick one harness point, they'll fuzz that, and they'll get most of the way there. Certain things won't get covered, but actually most people just stop and they don't even look at what, the, what didn't get covered. Or maybe they'll look and they'll say, eh, it's not important. And that's fine. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's always a risk decision about how much you want to do. But what I'm going to propose you want to do if you really care about getting to everything is you, you think about writing multiple harnesses to cover as much as you can, or at least the really complex stuff. Uh, because I think that you're better off if you start to move to the mindset of this uh, diagram on the right here, where it's like, oh, my first harness didn't get all the way there. Let, let me write another one that does get me there. Or another common one for libraries is that there's probably multiple entry points, and so I should fuzz that other one and see if that gets me further. Because a lot of the time, when you look at what doesn't get covered, you know, you look at these, uh, these gray nodes that didn't get covered. The reason is, is because there's some flag that gets set at the very top near the entry point that keeps you from getting all the way down there. And so sometimes uh, you, need to, you need to come at problems from a different way to get to the ideal of near 100% coverage. I mean, it's just, it's just reality that you can't expect to fuzz one thing and get to all of the code, no matter how good your fuzzer is. So 
I'm gonna take this idea that I just presented about, hey, we should try having multiple harnesses for code bases and see if we can find new bugs. Because if we go back to the law of fuzzing, the corollary is then, if you can fuzz the same thing differently, really, now you're just finding different parts of that code that haven't been fuzzed, and so law of fuzzing applies. So the experiment that, I'm, that I did was fuzzing existing targets, getting coverage, and then suggesting new harness points. But the question was, how do you, how do you suggest, what do you, what do, you do next? Uh, and my intuition was, well, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the functions in the call graph, then we can start to reason about what the interesting parts are. And constructing the call graph in Binary Ninja is like stupid simple. It's just these two lines right here, and it makes it a, uh, a dictionary that you can then pass into uh, whatever your graphing abstraction of choice is. I use Network X. So now that you have a call dictionary, you just have to think about, okay, what is, what functions can reach the most uncovered code, and that's interesting. And then if you overlay on top of that, this idea of complexity, which is just a common thing that people think about when they're thinking about where bugs are, right? Is like, what's the most complicated code that hasn't been executed yet? I wanna fuzz that, right? Just makes sense. Uh, so we're just gonna recommend based on those things, call graph and complexity. And the cool thing there is that this scales, right? Manually, this is what people would do anyways, but you can run this very quickly just by automated pipelines as opposed to like having to spend the time to get familiar with a code base to be able to do this. And then the other thing is that because these are just recommendations, you know, there's still the manual component that you're gonna have to look at and think about, mm, is this a good thing to harness or not? Uh, because it's sort of a suggestion and not a hard you have to do this thing, it doesn't have to be perfect which is really helpful because a human can sort through recommendations and say like, that doesn't make sense and I know why, but the computer doesn't. If this seems like too simple of an approach, let me show you. This is a manually, <laughs> I put this, this uh, graph together. This is three layers in from an entry point on libjpeg turbo. And you might look at this and say, this is perfect for fuzzing. And you'd be right, a single entry point that dominates all of that complexity, that's awesome. Except those three orange dots are all exported functions, which means in theory that somebody in, you know, in the world is using all three of those functions. But the public fuzz harness only picks that one. And I looked at this and I was kind of like, why did they pick that one? I still don't know. Uh, so what that means is, is that when you fuzz that one uh, entry point, yeah, you're only covering these red dots, which does cover a lot of the complexity, um, but you miss some. You miss all of that left side and the big, uh, the big, node that I labeled with an X, I enlarged because it represented a very complex function that actually had a bug in it. Um, somebody else apparently had the same idea as me, it was fuzzing this target, and so they independently discovered the bug and reported it before I did. But it's pretty validating to go like, well hey, somebody else looked at it and picked this red dot, and my automated tools said, there's other stuff you should look at. And it, it was that simple. Um, when I was looking across different open source Fuzz harnesses, like Google's OSS Fuzz, has a lot of uh, good examples. I tested and I was looking across things and I saw a lot of people, they really do only write one fuzz target and that means they're probably missing a lot. There was one target I looked at though that had 29 separate harnesses. And then the cool thing there was I was able to run this tool and get recommendations out of it. It's like, good luck doing that manually, right? Reasoning across the coverage of 29 harnesses. Um, yeah, and the ability to, to automate all of this is super powerful. So if we look at one case study, I had a, a target that was a regex library for multiple encodings. It only had one libfuzzer harness. So like this is the perfect thing to look at and get another harness going for. What did, what did the suggestions based on complexity and call graph analysis suggest? Well, it said, hey, you know, there's this function over here for supporting multiple encodings, and there's this function over here for multiple syntaxes, because they allowed you to specify a regex in one encoding, and a pattern, or in a string to look for, in another encoding. And they supported 30 different encodings. So that is a lot of complexity to be able to do that perfectly across all 30 of those things. And they supported eight different syntaxes, like Perl, grep, extended, you know, et cetera. And so this is the perfect thing for fuzzing because nobody can really reason across something that has that sort of combinatoric complexity. Like if you have eight independent options, that's two to the eighth possibilities, right? 
So this is the perfect thing for fuzzing. If you have stuff that looks like this, where you have independent options that can be applied and you do different functionality, like that is definitely the stuff you have to fuzz because it's very difficult to manage all that complexity uh, in your head. So did it work? At the end of the day, yes, it's quite effective. This probably shouldn't surprise anybody because I'm not talking about designing a new fuzzer. I'm talking about doing more work and fuzzing more things, but just having automated coverage analysis help you do that intelligently and saving you time to do it. Uh, I didn't see many people talking about that question though. If, if you fuzz one thing, if you audit one thing, like what to do next, uh, I think that this is an interesting area of research. Now, it's not perfect though. C++ is problematic because the call graphs can end up looking a little wonky. This works best on big targets where they're very orthogonal, which is to say there's not a lot of overlap between the entry points. Like if somebody's really good about having a tight code base where there's a lot of reuse of code rather than duplication and slight differences, um, yeah, simpler, less orthogonal code is, is less likely to have bugs in general, so naturally it doesn't work as well there. And yeah, you still have to do manual work, but this is a, a, an interesting first step, and trust me, it works for finding bugs. So let's start to bring it back around. At the end of the day, if this is you, I hope you know what to do. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna talk about when to stop fuzzing, like, okay, but seriously, when is enough? My ideal, this is my personal opinion, is that you should be fuzzing all of your exported functions. If you're a library, um, if you're just an executable, anywhere that you take input in from an external source should be fuzzed. You should be fuzzing high complexity functions. Ideally, you don't write them, but if you've got some crazy complex function, you should try to fuzz that and you should fuzz every release version, uh, or nightly, because, I mean, I think OSS Fuzz has some pretty crazy numbers on the number of regressions that they find, because, you know, today your code is bug-free, but tomorrow you might make a mistake. Uh, but if you're, not, if, you're, if you're not trying to be perfect, like, look, I realize not everybody has limitless time to write fuzz harnesses for everything, you should at least fuzz your primary sources of input. And if you have, a, have difficulty fuzzing something, my guess is your code is just difficult to test anyways, and maybe you should think about that. Because if you put together the stuff to mock up and test your code well, then you can probably fuzz it the same way. So future work, you can use other types of coverage. I use block coverage because it worked. I think that it's also easily visualized, like that was one of the things with edge coverage, is it's hard to wrap your head around uh, seeing edges taken and reason about it the same way that blocks are. Maybe it's just because blocks are bigger than the, the lines. Uh, but the human reasoning is a big part of it. And size and speed matter too, because if you're looking at a big target with like 50,000 inputs, like it does start to require uh, a lot of computation and memory. But the cool thing is, is that this same idea could also be linked in with an abstraction for source, and then you could start to reason about source code in a similar fashion. I didn't do that, but it, you know, it's open source, so you can check it out. But what I did want to say is that I think that this is sort of the first step towards trends that I've already been seeing. So I like using Binary Ninja, and I don't like having to flip through a bunch of different tools. So I'm a big proponent of bringing everything together. That's kind of what BNCov does, and I think it's pretty powerful. I think we need to continue to see more of this stuff, and if you write plugins for Binary Ninja, you can make Binary Ninja your front end for your tool, which I think makes it a lot easier. And this has already begun. So uh, this is another plugin called Sorcery Pane that as you click around in Binary Ninja, if it's a debug build and you have access to the source, like you just put in the source path where the code lives if, it, if you didn't build it on that machine, as you click around, it'll skip to wherever that line is in the source file and show you that. So if you can see, like I've got this, this and instruction highlighted here and it's, it corresponds to this if condition right here and you can see the coverage in Binary Ninja. So that's just bringing all these pieces together. So once we start getting the debugger and other things going in there, I think it'll be pretty powerful. So just to summarize, we talked about fuzzing, talked about code coverage, talked about this new abstraction, being able to reason over things and bring in Binary Ninja information, being super powerful, um, applying coverage, knowing what to fuzz next, finding new bugs, and then some future ideas. So that's all I got. This is the, the link. You can just Google BNCov. Uh, pull requests are open, so if you want to contribute an awesome script or something like that, I'd love to see what you're thinking. Uh, 
that's my contact info at the bottom, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was, can you use this to guide the, uh, to guide the fuzzer, basically, put, uh, or prioritize inputs for the fuzzer? And the answer is definitely yes. So there's, there's a couple of techniques that you could use for that. One would just to be, you know, focus on inputs that only reach there. Um, another thing would be if you have flexible instrumentation, like uh, even AFL, I believe they're Clang fast allows you to specify like a function whitelist or something like that. You could do that too. But yes, this definitely allows you to say, hey, these are the seeds that got to my function of interest. And so you could either make a corpus that just starts with those or something like that. Uh, yeah, otherwise you, you would have to have some sort of mechanism between, uh, like it depends on how your fuzzer would allow you to focus on things. Uh, yeah, so the question was, does, does feature map show the highlighting? Uh, not currently, I don't think it does. Uh, I haven't looked at that to see if that's modifiable. All right, well, if anybody has any questions, uh, I will be hanging out just outside. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming out on Sunday.